What is up? Jeff Lerner here, going live like I do most days of the week. Great to see everyone who is no doubt about to be flooding onto the live stream. Feel free to hop on, tell me your name, tell me where you're from, tell me what you're most excited to accomplish between now and the end of the year. I'm going to say that again because I know it takes a minute sometimes for the stream to spool up and everybody to hop on. I want to know who you are, your name, especially on Instagram, all I can see is your handle. I want to know your name. I want to know where you're from. And I want to know what you are most excited about crushing between now and the end of the year. See, it's November 17th. That means we got 13 plus 31, 44 days left this year. And usually this time of year, what's up, Jeff? Appreciate you being here, my man. I heard that uh, your interview went great earlier today. Thanks for uh, being kind to my better half. Brian, what's up, my friend? So again, where you're coming from, where you're, where you're tuning in from, and what you are excited to crush through the end of the year. Heather says, she's Heather from Las Vegas, 5K a month. Josh says, I'm from Canada. I'm excited. I can't wait to reach my physical goals. That's what I'm talking about. Record 20 more podcasts. Jeff, yes, I know that your action habits are massive. What's up, Miko? What's up, Tim? So uh, 44 days left in the year. And this time of year, oh, this time of year, I totally get on my, my pulpit and I start banging the gavel. Do you bang a gavel on a pulpit? I don't know. Banging the pulpit, whatever you bang on a gavel. Because this time of year, I swear, I look around. And here's the thing. I've learned to love this time of year. It used to frustrate me because people this time of year, they back off. They get soft. Literally, they get soft because they can't stop themselves from eating all the gingerbread cookies and whatnot. I love it because this time of year, I double down. I go extra hard. You know what? There are two wonderful days in this holiday season that I, I will celebrate with the best of them. One is Thanksgiving Day, one is Christmas Day, because those are the holidays on the calendar. Those are perfectly reasonable days to totally take off, chill with the fam, have, have a, a grand old time, you know, tis the season, right? But the idea that like for the next six weeks, I'm supposed to be kind of, kind of, you know, taking it easy makes no sense to me. Six weeks, that's over 10% of the year. That's over 10% of the year. Imagine if I said, hey, listen, I'm going to take 10% of the money out of your bank account. Is that cool? But don't worry. You still got compounding. You're still earning that 1% or whatever they pay you in the savings account. But listen, I'm going to take 10% because it's that time of year and we all just, you know, we back off. We, we kind of waste the, the last 10% of each year. That's what we do. But don't worry. You still got growth. You, you, you'll, you'll make it back next year. What? What? That makes no sense. And yet everybody does it. This time of year, you call, you try to get deals done, you try to get meetings scheduled. And people say, let's revisit when we set our budgets. Let's, you know, we're not really doing any new initiatives. Okay, great. Corporate, schmorkbrit, no new initiatives, whatever. But me, I'm going extra hard. I'll tell you what, this month, I'm setting my personal record for most revenue ever generated in a month in all business of my life and I'm doing it so that I can move the bar forward so that I can break it next month. December will be the record, the next record month and then followed by January, followed by February, every single month. Look, we live in a what have you done for me lately world and most of all, you gotta say it to yourself. Jeff, I'm looking you in the mirror. You guys can't see, but in my phone, I see my reflection. Jeff, my friend, what have you done for me lately? I don't care about last month. That's great. I don't care that it's November. I don't care that it's December. I don't care that the rest of the world seems to want to chill. Look, I don't know if you checked the news, but we've been chilling all year. I don't, they sent us home in March. And I'm not talking about sent us home just physically from a corporate workplace. I'm talking about mentally. We all kind of like got sent home. My kids, they were sent home from school. Bi most businesses, they're like, oh, I'm, yeah, COVID, uh, excuses, uh, hardship, uh, election, uh, distraction, uh, I'm chilling. No, screw that, man. Screw that. Which is why we're talking today about my friends who I would, I would, I would revere and salute 
every chance I could get the Navy SEALs. Today, we're talking about taking a Navy SEAL approach to business. Again, I want you to ver voice it. I want you to express it, exclaim it, put it out there to the world, to yourself right now on the internet. Your name, where you're from, and what you are going to crush between now and the end of the year. I want to hear it. I, I want you to hear it. I want you to see it. it doesn't matter. I'm not going to do the work. You're going to do the work. So anyway, my friends, the Navy SEALs, there's some core concepts. I'm like a, I'm like a little bit nuts about the Navy SEALs. Like I, maybe I romanticize them in my mind ever since I saw the movie with Charlie Sheen and who's it? Michael Bean. I think the Navy SEALs movie from when I was a kid, I'm totally dating myself. It was like a kind of a cheesy nineties movie, but like, I just, I love the badassery. I love the culture. I love the intensity. I love the loyalty. I love the commitment. I love the, the, you know, the, the, it's not the size of the, the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. I mean, these little, these little groups go in and they just wreck shit, man. They wreck shit. They wreck. You, you could put them up against a thousand times as many people and they'll just wreck it because their training, their discipline, their culture, their preparation. I'm just, I'm obsessed with it. I love it. It's how I approach my business. It's how I try to approach my life. Every every day, I, probably literally every single day, at some point when I'm starting to, I want to like be a little wuss in my mind, I'm like, man, seals do, seals do this stuff in their sleep. Whatever it is, if it's enduring stress, it's enduring fatigue, it's enduring hardship, it's enduring fear. You know, you ever think about that? Like I posted this thing on my Facebook the other day that was a, some of you may have seen it. It was a guy riding a bike, I want to say in the Pakistani Himalayas. And this guy's riding this bike along like knife's edge cliffs with like thousand foot drops on either side. And he, I mean, he's doing just craziness and he's zigging and zagging and flying all around, just looking relaxed, totally keeping his cool. And I saw that and I'm like, you know, and people say, I posted this. I said, people say that starting a business is too risky. Give me a break, dude. First of all, never mind the fact that I actually think that putting all your chips in with long form corporate employment for some golden handcuff slash pot of gold at the end of some hypothetical rainbow that realistically most people in the corporate world are never actually going to get. Their bosses might get it. The owners might get it. You look, I own a company. I love when people work hard to help me make more money. And in my case, I try to be the kind of company that actually makes it worth their while, but not everybody does. I know I'm the anomaly. Most people, they are their profit margin is the difference between the value you create and what they actually have to pay you. And their goal is to increase profit margin by getting more out of you and or by paying less to you and or by eliminating you so that you're a zero on their balance sheet because they use systems or automation or dump it or pushing more work on other people to get rid of you entirely. Like, look, that's, that's, that's business. That's economics. That's fine. That's capitalism. But for the individual at the micro, let's not confuse the macro and the micro. I think capitalism is the greatest macro system that's ever existed. But at a micro level, that's right, Tim. That's right. Discipline equals freedom. Where is it? I've got that um, somewhere over here. I've got extreme ownership. Now I can't find it. But yeah, man, discipline equals freedom. Amen to that. But listen, I mean, let's not confuse the macro with the micro. At the micro level, the individual, I'm trying to give the power back to the individual. I'm trying to inspire and empower and educate and swift kick in the ass the individual to step up and take control of their life. All the tools are out there. Take it from this guy. Take it from this guy. I was broke. I was depressed. I was overweight. I was so pasty. You could have confused me for Elmer's glue. Living in my soon-to-be ex-wife's parents' spare bedroom. Living in shame and, and embarrassment. Hold up in the bedroom. Not even wanting to leave the room because everybody thought I was such a loser. And I said, I'm going to... I know I've heard it. I've seen it. I've seen guys that have done it. I know there's tools out there that'll give me different opportunities in my life. And I thought it was just tools. It wasn't just tools. It's different ways of thinking. It's different ways of being in the world. It's a different orientation to the world around you. 
It's a commitment to creating value rather than just trying to see what value you can get from. Try to figure out what value you can give to and be blown away. Here's the thing. We live in a, we live in a wonderful world. There's cynics, the media out there, all, these neg all this negativity. Make it, make it seem like the world isn't fair. The world is unjust. The world is hard. The world is mean. The world is cruel. Bullshit. Bullshit. We live in a world where if you give maximum value to the world, if you, if you push yourself to find out what your true human capacity is in the form of how much value can I create and project out to the world, you will be blown away by what comes back to you. And that is not a dark, mean, ugly world. That is a beautiful world. I, I suspect for much of human history, there was very little that most people could do to, to really change their fortunes. You know, I think about like, I mean, I'll look, all I know is from the movies, but I think about like old movies and you got the, the kid who's the blacksmith in the shop living in dirt. You've got the, the indentured servant who's working the field for the noble. You've got the, the caste system. You've got deeply embedded so societal norms that say you, there's no vertical mobility. You think about most of the times in human history, there was no such thing as like, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go give maximum value to the world around me. I'm going to help enough other people to get what they want out of this life that it'll kick back to me and I'll get everything I want too. Like, I don't think that was true for most of human history, but it is 100% true now. It's true today. It was true in 2008 when I first got wind of this idea. It's been true every year since. It doesn't matter. Boom time, bust time, recession, depression, Stock market's up, stock market's down. It has always been true in my professional life that the more value you give, the more reward you get. And that is awesome. And that makes us the luckiest group of humans in the history of this planet to have ever lived. That we actually have a joystick we can wiggle to change our futures. Would have gotten burned at the stake. Christian, let me tell you, man, I have often thought how good it is that I was not born in other times because I would have been burned at the stake. Look, I had a job for three weeks when I was 16 years old and I was, I was repelled by it. I found it so distasteful. I got myself fired after three weeks. I said, I will never work under someone's thumb again. I will never clock in on someone else's schedule again. I will never wear someone else's prescribed attire again. I, I, you know, look, it's fine if it's my choice. You know, they call me for a gig when I was a musician. I say, yeah, you know what? I want the gig or I don't want the gig. What do I have to wear? They said, oh, you got to wear a tux. I said, eh, I don't really feel like the monkey suit this weekend. I'm going to pass. Or, hey, you know what? I'd, I could use the money. Yeah, I'm going to say yes. But it was always on my terms. That part of my life was always on my terms. But the idea that I was going to be wholesale enrolled in a system that left, that, that was totally binary. You're either all in or you're all out. And if you're all in, you do everything we tell you or else we will push you out and you will have nothing, which by the way is a fallacy. It's something that people mentally subscribe to and therefore it becomes their truth. It's not real. Sometimes the best thing that could happen to you would be to, sh to be shoved out of your, your job or your, your corporate autocracy or whatever it is. But you know, look, to each their own. I'm just saying, man, how, how much I struggled with what I considered to be unqualified authority. Look, I'll, I, I have no problem, uh, you know, respecting authority. Put me in a room full of Navy SEALs. I got nothing to say, man. I'm just going to sit there and listen and soak up all I can and, 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 and revere and honor and acknowledge what they've got, the value they have to offer me. I'm not going to sit in there going, I want to be in charge here. Hell no. But to be in a room full of unqualified authority and have to just submit because it's my damn job took me three weeks to figure out I was never going to be willing to do that. That was 25 years ago. And to Christian's point, if I lived in any other time in history, I'd probably, I would probably have like a full William Wallace situation. They'd be ripping my guts out or they'd be tying me to to wagons and whipping the horses to rip my limbs apart. They'd be doing horrible, despicable things to me because I just refuse to play by those rules. I always have. So I'm grateful I live in this time. But the thing is, it's the same time for everyone else too. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a, I've got a head start. You know, I started 12 years ago and, and I'm not going to pretend that it happens overnight for people. In fact, I, I started 25 years ago. 
Started when I was 16. After that three weeks on the job, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Got my ass whooped for 12 years by the school of hard knocks, by life as it should be, which says you want something rare and special, you're going to have to endure a rare and special hardship in order to get it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And by the way, that's how the Navy SEALs work. You want to be part of these teams? You want to be part of something rare and special? Great. Report to San Diego next week. We're taking you through boot camp. We're taking you through buds. We're going to kick the shit out of you for months. See if you got what, what it takes to ultimately come out the other side where you deserve to be a SEAL. Uh, that's why I love them. That's why I love the culture. Because they are so unapologetic about being elite. Can we just be unapologetic for once about being elite and stop pretending that everybody deserves things that they aren't willing to work for? What's up, my man, Matt Kelly? I know you feel me. 38 years in martial arts, three black belts. Tell me I'm wrong. Can we just stop apologizing for maintaining elite standards and insisting that people who want elite outcomes have to do what elite standards dictate they should have to do? And it's hard. It's meant to be hard. But you want to know one of the reasons why it's hard? Let me tell you, this whole concept of it being hard is a, is a construct. It's hard because we define hard in, a, in relative terms. We think stuff is hard because most people complain about it. That's not, a, that's not an absolute basis for something being hard. That just means most other people are soft. If everybody complains about it, think, look, I promise you, day-to-day -day living, like there's this hilarious movie called A Million Ways to Die in the West. It's, it's a Seth MacFarlane movie, the guy that's, that uh, created South Park. I love that movie. It's so funny because the premise of the movie is how freaking hard and miserable it was to live in the Old West. Like, you know, there's all this stuff in the movie, like getting bit by snakes and, you know, uh, I don't know, having blocks of ice brought in from cut off of glaciers and they fall on somebody's head and his head explodes and like all this, the hardship of living in the old West. But look, you go to the old West and you walk around going, man, I don't know how you do this. It's so hard, bro. You should quit. You should, you should opt out of the old West. It's so hard. They'd be like, dude, I got no choice. It's the old West. It's hard. Or I, I guess it's hard because you're telling me it's hard. You must come from some super mushy time in the future when your life makes this look hard, but like, it's all about context. It's all about frame of reference, right? The reality is hard is a relative designation based on the average, the, the collective agreement of a, of a large group of people who by definition are average. So I actually think it's a complete BS metric to say anything is hard or easy. It's all relative. Go pluck somebody out of a concentration camp who's been living there for four years. You know, I just read um, Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. Go read that book and then say, you know what? I'm going to go meet one of the characters in that book and I'm going to invite them into the future. I'm going to invite them into our time. And I'm going to say, hey, you can have any life you want, but you have to do this, 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 and this that, that are you know prescribed for that outcome. And you think they're going to go, oh man, I don't know. That, seemed, that sounds too hard to me. It's all relative. They just came from hard. So they realize that our hard is actually laughably easy. You know, look, we live in this. I'm glad that I'm speaking to Instagram. I'm glad that I'm speaking to YouTube. Wonderful people connect to those platforms, but those platforms themselves are a huge part of the problem. Look at the culture. Breathe the, the air and the atmosphere on those platforms. What, what is success on those platforms? Success is... Uh, hanging out on the Amalfi Coast on your boat, smoking a cigar, looking like you ain't got a care in the world. By the way, you're, you're 23 years old and you're an you're a e-com millionaire. What the hell does any of that mean? That's a filter, man. That's just a filter somebody applied to some made-up picture where they're, they're renting the boat and they're spending their entire income paying photographers to follow them around and they're wearing these dumbass linen shirts that try to make themselves look like a, some you know 80s drug dealer living the life. Like it's all a facade. It's all bullshit. Success is in the grind. It's in the grit. It's in the mud. And that even that doesn't have to be a bad thing. You just learn to you just learn to love that. You just learn to love that. That's what I think is so cool about the Navy SEALs, man. They love that shit. 
They eat it up. They're happiest when they're living in some, you know, dusty tent living off MRPs, you know, the, the, the military rations, making shit happen, defending freedom, right? Why? Why, why are they happy in those conditions? Because they believe in their cause. They believe in their mission. They have a mission and a purpose and they live by a set of values that transcend temporary discomfort. So maybe embrace the suck. Amen to that, Matt Kelly. <sighs> Got a lot of good feedback happening here. I'm glad. I feel like we've, we've found a vein here. I think the world, this is what I've found is you go on the internet. It's a, to me, it's amazing how big the world is. There's such a giant body of people in this world that are spouting such total entitled gibberish. And yet there's also such a huge body of people in this world that are totally aligned with truth, wisdom, values, and, and you know driving principles that can actually set people free. The world's just so big. And so it's easy to get discouraged. You see all the nonsense. You know, oh, the world's full of nonsense. But then it's easy to get inspired. You see all the the positive people, like, oh, the world's full of positivity. And the reality is the world's full of all of it. And ultimately, which side you land on for me is about why I'm doing what I do. Mission, vision, and values. You get clear on those, hard gets easy. And it's like, it's like somebody said on Instagram the other day, if you want life to be easy, do the hard things. If you want life to be hard, do the easy things, right? <laughs> Anyways, amazing, amazing feedback I'm getting from people. So let's talk a little more about these seals. One thing I love about the seals, they say, get ready now. Because by the time you need to be ready, it's going to be too late to get ready. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share how I'm personally experiencing now. What's up, Joe Curry, my man? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share how I'm personally experiencing that. The reality is... And, and I don't like these lives to be self-aggrandizing, but at the same time, there's a fine line because you got to put yourself out there. You got to put your future out there. You got to put your best self out there. You got to allow your super ego to come into, into corporeal existence, partly just to create some pressure on yourself. You say these big things. It's like Babe Ruth calling his shot, right? He points to the, points to the fences. He doesn't hit that ball over it, man. He's going to have a hard time sleeping that night. So for me, I'm looking at, at where what's happened in the last two years, where we are, where we're headed. I, I, am, I am moving into a realm that is so far beyond what I reasonably ever should have, could have expected for myself or, or, or based, on, based on what people tell you, based on what your teachers tell you, your principals tell you, your guidance counselors tell you, your professors tell you, even for many of us, your own family tells you to say, hey, this is where you're going to be someday. Look, I, wh where, I'm, where I'm headed in the next couple of years with everything that's going on, look, if I hadn't started getting ready 25 years ago and I wasn't still getting ready 12 years ago when I started online and I wasn't still getting ready seven years ago when I started my agency and learned to build teams and I wasn't start, get, didn't start getting ready two and a half years ago when I figured out how to do the content product creation grind at a, at a massive level of output and I wasn't ready now having the, the conversations that I'm having on the interviews that I'm having with people that are, are you know up a station for me and ultimately just constantly pushing and pushing, leveling up and leveling up, then where I'm going two, three, five years from now would freak the shit out of me. I would be based on my own future and my own trajectory. If I hadn't been getting ready since I was a kid, get ready now for the life that you want to have. How many people think that once they have a lot of money, they'll get their shit together? Let's be honest. How many, you don't have to say it for, unless you want to be uh, brutally transparent and say that actually you, you struggle with that sometimes thinking that once you have the money, then you'll get your shit together. Then you'll get in shape. Then you'll get psychologically stable. Then you'll get emotionally fit. Then you'll get relationally competent. Then you'll get effective in terms of your communication. You won't be angry anymore. You won't be bitter anymore. You won't be shy anymore. You won't play small anymore. You won't cut yourself off at the knees anymore. If you just had enough money, right? A lot of us think that way. I used to think that way. 
until I realized money is the last puzzle piece. Literally, you know that feeling when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle and you get down and there's just like one piece left. I always, I usually call like my son or my wife if we're all working on on a, a puzzle. I'll be like, hey, hey, Jay, sir. Lately, we we let Stella do it. Now she's four. She's like old enough not to eat the puzzle piece. Like, hey, Stella, you want to put the last piece in the puzzle? And when you put that last piece in the puzzle and you see the whole picture click together, it's so satisfying, right? It's like popping a zit. It's like catharsis, right? That's making money. Making money is the last puzzle piece. I got my ass beat from 16 to 29, digging downward holes, seeing the walls of dirt go up around me because my efforts were taking me down, not up, before I ever actually got to make enough money that any sort of picture seemed clear to me. Money is a lagging indicator of success. And even then, I thought I was like, oh, sweet, I'm good. I made money. I'm making good money. Screwed it up multiple times because there was still more work to do. Still more work to do. And eventually, hey, babe. Oh my gosh, I get so excited when my wife comes onto my lives. I can't wait to see her. Miss you, babe. Listen, though, I, I'm serious. Like, that's the Navy SEAL thing, man. Like, like look, money is like winning the war. Winning the war is the lagging indicator of progress in the war. You got to win all the battles. You got to extinguish all the enemies. You got to literally push them to the point of throwing up the white flag. And then the politicians have to come in and negotiate and all the machinations have to, to happen. And months later, you can finally take a breath and go, we won. We won the war. That's making money. A lot of shit has to happen before you can win the war. A lot of shit has to happen before. Here's the thing. It's not even before you can make money. A lot of shit has to happen before you deserve money. What is money? Money is the, is the thing in this world that is probably the most prized. It is the thing that most people are most obsessed with getting more of. It is that precious. It's more precious than gold. It's more precious than food. It's more precious than sex. It's more precious than drugs. It is the most precious thing in the world based on the, the, the collective assessment of human desires. And so we think, we think it's going to be easy to compete with 7 billion people for the thing that everybody wants the most. And they say they want other things, but I'm talking about their actions. I'm talking about measured by the number of calories that they burn in a day. What are they spending those calories? What, what are they burning those calories in pursuit of? It's money. So when you're, when you're running a race with 7 billion people, and look, I'm an abundance guy. There's plenty out there for everyone, but there's a system there's a system that is conscripted to keep the mass amount of people as ignorant as possible because there's, there's the concentrations of money that are somewhat buttressed by the ignorance of most people who think they're doing the work to get it, but really they're just doing the work to create it for the people who already have a shitload of it. That's the construct. That's the work that we're doing. That's the war that we're fighting. To win that war... You have to do all the work that it takes to win a war and accept that money is the white flag. Money is what's going to happen when the enemy surrenders. And it's hard and it's long and it's brutal and it's gut-wrenching and it's exactly how it's supposed to be. It's easy for me to pontificate and say all this stuff with the plaques and the nice life because I got my shit shoved in for decades. I've earned that right. <sighs> Anyways, so Navy SEALs, get ready now because by the time you need to be ready, it's eating. You know, I think about one time, I, I think actually I've had so many of these, so many of these things happen. You know, when I was uh, like 2010, I was invited to speak on a stage in front of a thousand people. It was one of the first times I ever got invited to speak anywhere. In front of a thousand people, I would have freaked out. Hold on, let me pull up the, the latest comments we got. <laughs> I would have freaked out. But the reality is when I was 17, I made a decision that said, I'm so, I'm so unwilling to do a job that I will do whatever I have to do 
and get as uncomfortable as I have, as I can possibly get, or as I need to get in order to have a life where I don't have to work a job. And for me, that meant learn an instrument, go play it for people, learn an instrument, go play it for people. My first gigs were for like two people. My first gigs were for like no people, or my first gigs were like shoved in a corner where nobody could hear me. But eventually I started playing bigger and bigger gigs. My first 50 gigs, I was so nervous. My hands shook. I would go to hit a D and I'd hit a C because the, 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 I don't know, the, the width of my shake was an inch was the width of a piano key. So I'd go to hit the key, but I'd be shaking so bad. I'd hit the key next to it. 50 gigs. I kept tally before my hands start started shaking. I had no idea at the time what I was really being prepared for, what I was really doing. I was getting to a place and then I got into school and then they put me on stage and I became the first chair piano player in the jazz orchestra. They started bringing in guest artists and I started getting to do the small groups with them. Suddenly, I was performing on stage at the Moore School of Music at the University of Houston, playing piano, totally exposed, spotlight, dark on the stage, spotlight on me, it's the piano solo, go. You got 64 bars, play anything. Improvise, make it up, just don't screw it up. And I went through that gauntlet. Again and again and again, hundreds and hundreds of times of being exposed, creating art in the format of jazz where there's no words. There's no right or wrong notes, but there is right or wrong concepts. And you either operate intelligently within the concepts or you self-destruct. And when you start to go off the rails, you go off bad. You go off fast. You get shamed in those circles. All of it, a grind. I wrote a musical in college. All the crazy shit I did, I realized it was preparing me for where I'm going. Mu uh, college, I wrote a musical. Why did I write a musical? I don't know. I was a jazz piano major. Why was I over in the theater school taking theater classes to write a musical? Because I just was interested in it. And I wanted to be challenged and I wanted to be pushed. And we wrote a musical and it was really good. And then the professor said, you should try to get this into a theater festival. So that summer, my writing partner and I, we called a hundred theater festivals. We sent off a hundred packets. 99 of them said no. One of them said yes, said, yeah, you got to be here in six weeks. It's the Minnesota Fringe Festival. It's a little arts festival up in Minneapolis. Be here in uh, six weeks. We'll put your show up. So I go round up some actors, da -da 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 -da, get grouped together, rehearse four weeks into rehearsals, two weeks until the show, male lead actor disappears. No shows. Gonzo. I got no actor. Show must go on, right? Guess what I've never done before? Acted, sung, danced, performed on stage. I'm talking about a kid that was bullied so bad as a childhood. I, was, I, I wouldn't even go eat lunch in the cafeteria at lunchtime in middle school because I didn't want the students to watch me get my food and walk with my tray over to a table. I was too embarrassed to even walk across a cafeteria in a lunch at the lunch hour I would bring my own lunch and I would eat it outside. That's the level of, of shame and, and body consciousness that I had. Now suddenly, whatever, 10, 12 years later, my actor drops out. I got to sing and dance and act or else the show's going to get canceled. So I did it. I said, I called a buddy of mine. I said, can you play the keyboards? I think I need to act. I'm the only one that knows the music. And it's, we only got two weeks. And I did it and I performed and I performed my, I performed my ass off, man. Something just flipped. It was just another one of those things where you go, listen, I can do what feels right, which is to be scared and play small, or I can do what feels absolutely terrifying, which is to, uh, you know, say, spare myself future regrets. And I did, I let it all hang out there. I was singing, I was dancing. I was, I am the worst dancer on earth. If there's one person that should not be doing a chorus line, it's me, but I let it all hang out. Went to Minneapolis, did two weeks of shows, never performed for more than 10 people. There were 300 people to go around. Never had more than 10 people in the audience. But one show, when I let it all hang out there, there was one guy in the audience who was the inventor of the Breathe Right strip. That thing that goes on your nose, randomly, the inventor of the Breathe Right strip is a patron of the arts and St. Paul, Minnesota, he came to one of the shows. He watched me, who'd never acted, sung, or danced before. And certainly wasn't, I mean, I, this was a comedy, by the way. Comedic timing is some hard shit. He saw me. He came up to me after the show. He's like, you're not a trained actor, are you? I said, no, honestly, man, I'm the, I'm, I'm the composer. <laughs> but the guy dropped out. 
And he said, I love your energy, man. Let's stay in touch. He ended up backing me on a future business. He ended up mentoring me, became one of the most important relationships to my development as an entrepreneur. I'm telling you, one thing leads to another when you are constantly challenging yourself, constantly putting yourself in uncomfortable situations because you know that you're getting ready for something special. And if you try to see what it is, it's like trying to trying to see all the green lights before you leave the house. You're never going to see it. You're never going to see the path and you're never going to know where it's going. But if you believe that you're being groomed by the universe for something special, then you will seek out the opportunities and the discomfort that will prepare you for that thing. Get ready now. The best thing would have been to start 20 years ago. But if you didn't start today, this is, you know, when I was in high school, I had this friend, by the way, his name's Rob Lord. I interviewed him on my podcast a couple, maybe a month or two ago. He's disrupting residential real estate in Dallas. He's just as insane as I am. And we used to dare each other to do stuff in high school. And we had this theory that people can only perceive absurdity up to a certain point. And if something goes beyond that point of absurdity, they actually become numb or oblivious and they won't even see it happen. Like if you walk into a party and you're a little bit overdressed and you talk a little bit too loud, people will be like, who's this obnoxious guy? And why is he overdressed and talking too loud? But if you walk into a party, I don't know, dressed like an iguana and, and squeaking and going, <laughs> wearing an iguana costume, people like won't even know what to do with it and they'll just kind of ignore you. It's crazy how other people respond to discomfort and you either get insanely comfortable with discomfort or you stay sanely uncomfortable with discomfort and pay the price for the rest of your life. My buddy and I, we used to, we used to do what we called mall walking. We would go into a mall and me and a couple other guys, and it was literally just yeah, the flaming hetero. Yes, that's totally him. Oh my gosh. I love that. That was your takeaway from the podcast. Uh, me, me and a couple guys in high school that really, that kind of instinctively recognize that if you want to do great things in this world, you have to go so far beyond what's considered societally normal. We would go to the mall, these big crowded shopping malls in Houston, Texas, and we would do what was called model walking. And we would walk around the mall I'm going to try to demonstrate this. This is kind of embarrassing. I don't know why I'm reliving all this stuff from my past, but we would walk around the mall and we would be like walk and we walk in a straight line. There'd be like a, a, a line of us, like three or four of us that would do this. And we would walk and we would walk like models. Like the rule was you had to kind of catwalk walk. And then we would all, the person at the front would freeze and strike a pose. This is happening in a crowded mall, by the way, the guy at the front would strike a pose, freeze. And then the person at the back of the line would have to run up to the front of the line and start walking. And then we'd all start walking again. And so it's like, imagine you're in a mall and you see a group of teenagers going like, doing like model walking and they all freeze. And we would do like ridiculous poses. We would freeze like, and then the guy walks behind and people were like, here's the thing. They just ignored us. They acted like it wasn't even happening. And it was literally, I don't know how to explain it, but me and Rob and a couple of us, we had this sense that like, you have to build the muscle. And, and particularly for me, because I was overcoming years of such insecurity and shame, I got so angry at feeling scared that I, I, I literally created these experiences in my life to start to build the muscle of not caring what other people thought. And I found that when you take it to a certain point, people just tune out. Like for me now, I look at all my old high school friends, other than a couple close ones like Rob and a few others. I mean, look, I, I'm running, I don't know. I, I, think, I think I've had 7 million views on my YouTube ads in the last 28 days. Like se literally 7 million. I could pull up the number. I'm pretty sure it's 7 million views on my YouTube chance that that you know if I took a hundred of my old buddies I went to high school with and people that knew me there's no chance that at least 80 of them haven't seen my YouTube ads guess how many have reached out zero because Jeff had other than Rob other than ones I'm actually still close friends with but none of them have like been like hey what are you doing man it seems like you've really like you're, you're doing something you're creating some noise you're disrupting the world especially in the time like this all everyone around me is 
is scared and you seem to be out there, you know, being bold, like what's up? No, none of them have reached out because it's so far beyond the conventional that the conventional can't even assimilate it. And it's cool. It doesn't matter. I'm not living for them. I'm not living for anyone. I'm 100% unapologetically living for the most elite version of myself. And I love it. I live for it. Every day I wake up so hungry to push it a little bit harder. And I hope you do too. And I, if I can do anything in this world, if I can service this world in any way, it's to show, it's to try to be a living demonstration. And I take this responsibility very seriously because to the like-minded people that do want special outcomes and that do want to push themselves in this world, I will do everything I can. I will literally like wear the skin off my knuckles trying to show that if, you, if you're willing to stretch that far, you can have all the riches of the world. And I don't just mean money. All the riches of the world are waiting for the people who are willing to stretch. And I will, I will exhaust myself as a living testament to that truth. Wanda asked one of my parents say, my, I don't know why it's making me emotional. My, my parents are my biggest fans. They really are. And they're so supportive and so cool. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's been a it's been a journey for sure. I just I encourage you to just keep pressing and keep keep getting weird, man. Get weird. Get out there. Get disruptive. Not not to be obnoxious. Not to make a scene. But just because that's what it takes. It takes a level of exertion and intensity and commitment and drive and creativity and and passion that is so foreign to most of the world that they will brand you a weirdo. But here's the thing, man. I was on a podcast with David Meltzer earlier and he said it and I'm stealing it. He said, find me a statue of a critic. Find me any statue in all the world that has ever been erected of a critic. There was a lot more critics than there were Shakespeare's. But now, hundreds of years later, are there more Shakespeare's, more statues of Shakespeare or more statues of his critics? Shakespeare has more statues hundreds of years later than he had all critics in his time. But at the time, they actually probably thought they had something over him. Anyway, I love and appreciate everyone. I, uh, I actually have to record a presentation for Entra. That's my remaining to-do list for the day. And it's going to take at least 90 minutes. And it's almost six o'clock and I would love to see Stella before she goes down for bed. So I'm going to adjourn, but thank you everyone so much for your time. And I will see you uh, on this live tomorrow. Take care.